Tonight on the Daily Debrief, prosecutors say it's a case of sex, lies, and deceit. A husband dead, his friend and wife accused of plotting, and now they're together. Denise Williams has paid out $1.75 million as a result of his death. Plus, testimony from the sobbing trigger man. Also, a new law firm report into the Larry Nassar sex abuse scandal places blame at the top. And sentencing tomorrow for the president's former lawyer. That's tonight on the Daily Debrief for Tuesday, December 11th. Good evening, everybody. Opening statements today for a woman on trial over the suspicious disappearance of her husband 18 years ago. We are calling it the so-called Love Triangle Murder Trial. Denise Williams of Florida faces charges for allegedly planning to murder her husband, Mike Williams. Mike had a friend named Brian Winchester. Winchester admitted he was the killer. And get this, Winchester married Denise Williams after the husband was out of the way. Mike Williams disappeared in 2000 after a duck hunting trip. People back then thought he drowned and was eaten by alligators. His mother never believed that. Denise Williams asked that he be declared dead after six months. The normal window in Florida for a death declaration is five years. She also collected her husband's $2 million insurance policy. The prosecution began its opening statements with the search for the body of Mike Williams. Florida Wildlife Commission are contacted as well as other family members and they start trying to figure out where he is. They find his Bronco as well as a trailer. The initial thought of course is that he uh, possibly <laughs> was running the boat out to go to his duck hunting area. He hit a stump, possibly was thrown overboard, boat went off um, and they were hopeful to find him maybe on this island back in here or something along those lines and move on. It's a very methodical search. Um, they do grid patterns. Um, they have a helicopter up, you have dive teams from Montgomery County, Alabama, you've got um, Jack, um, Jackson County Sheriff officers that are there participating in this, and as I mentioned, you've also got friends and families um, that are participating in this search as well. This is Mike's uh, hunting boat, that hunting boat, as you can see, is what they call a canoe. It's essentially a uh, canoe that's powered by a motor. They actually found that boat about 75 yards away from where they found the Bronco. It's another little cove that's in this particular area is where they found the boat. Unfortunately, during that time period, they were not able to find Mike. Mr. Williams is still missing. The reality sets in that at this point has become a recovery operation. But they bring out search dogs. They're going to have probing poles, and what those are, PVC poles, where they take and they push them down and they try and find Mike's body. The only thing they found immediately after Mike Williams' disappearance was a hat. But then six months later, a new clue and a return to a suspicious location from the first search. You're going to hear from Joe Sheffield, who is the person that goes out there and avidly fishes at that particular time of summer months now. And he's out there fishing and he comes up across a set of waders. And he's going to describe to you what those waders look like. They send diver down to that particular location. And again, they are back at that marker, that hole, that 12-foot hole where they felt the initial push. And they mark with the bamboo sticks, ultimately the PVC pipe. And what you're going to hear is not only were the waders found, but there's a jacket found, a flashlight, and a hunting license. That hunting license belonged to Mike Williams. It's a flashlight that's found. Flashlight was one of those mag lights. Um, was actually still functional. Mike still has not been recovered, and the case goes cold. At this point, it is marked as a missing persons. There's been no evidence of any foul play in any way, shape, or form. It's simply a duck hunting boat accident. Body was never found. There are even theories of alligators possibly had eaten him. And there's that reference to alligators, folks. Prosecutors said it all became suspicious when the friend married the victim's wife. Authorities tried to obtain phone records, but the case went cold. Even though De Denise Williams cashed in on the victim's $1.75 million insurance policies. Here is how the case unraveled. In August of 2016, Brian Winchester, in the early morning hours, frustrated with the separation, Frustrated with where the marriage is going, frustrated with Denise, crawls in the back of her car at her home. He does so with a firearm. 
He orders her to drive somewhere. Denise, you're going to hear, talks him out of going to that particular area and ends up going to a CVS pharmacy on the north side of town. Instead, somehow she's able to do that. And you're going to hear they have a long conversation about multiple things, and you're going to hear from Brian Winchester, and he's going to tell you what they talked about. And what you're going to hear is they separate at that point, and Denise talks him into letting her go. And he does. And they're going to talk later on that evening is the plan. The agreement is she's not going to go to law enforcement. But she does. You're actually going to hear that David McCraney, who is the brother-in-law of Denise um, Williams now, is a law enforcement officer at Tallahassee Police Department. And he gets on the phone with her and talks her through what to do and takes her all the way to Leon County Sheriff's Department. So Denise Williams talks. The lover also confesses that the affair had gone on for years before the husband's death. The lover explained the crime and showed police where the body was hidden. The defense says there's a big problem, though, with the state's case. Let me begin by saying that there is no dispute about the fact that Mike Williams was murdered. Um, the evidence is going to show beyond any doubt that he was shot in the face and killed by Brian Winchester, a man he thought was his friend. Brian Winchester is not on trial. In fact, he's never even been charged with the murder. He's going to testify here as a witness. And there's an important part of that that you haven't heard yet that I want that will be in evidence and I want to tell you about it. And that's the fact that he is going to be testifying under a grant of immunity. And what that means in this particular case, the kind of immunity that was given to him, is that he will be able to say he will be able to testify as he pleases about this without any fear that the state will be able to use that testimony against him. Now, the, the immunity agreement is such that the state can't even use leads or hints or clues that were developed from that testimony. So he has not been charged. Uh, and I think it's fair, uh, fair from the evidence to conclude that it's not likely he will ever be charged for this murder. But he's here as a witness, and he's going to testify. The issue you're going to have to decide is whether to believe him. Tonight on The Debrief, attorney Matthew Bangino is with us from Pittsburgh. Vincent Hill is a law enforcement expert and host here on the Law and Crime Network. He's going to join us in a second. But, Matt, let me ask you this one. This is a common defense tactic here. Blame the other guy. But does it work for the woman who didn't pull the trigger? Well, of course, you know, the defense is going to try to force uh, the jury to understand that, that he has some incentive here uh, to testify. He, uh, without a question, murdered Mike Williams. And, you know, he has this agreement with the government uh, that's going to prevent him from being charged. And he got that agreement with the government because he would agree to implicate Denise Williams. And that's what's the most important factor in this case for the defense. He has the reason for doing what he's doing. Exactly. So it does work for the woman who didn't pull the trigger because she didn't pull the trigger. The other guy did. He's going to be on the stand in just a second here on the debrief. Vincent, I got to ask you about the police work here. This seems like a difficult case for police work because this goes all the way back to the year 2000. And they were saying not a lot of text messages. Phone records are gone by that point. Right. Not only that, Aaron, when uh, investigators were initially investigating this, it was a simple missing person report. So now, seven years later, when they start looking at this as a possible murder, you have to go back seven years and try to collect evidence, alibis, things of that nature. It makes it very difficult because no crime scene was actually preserved way back in December of 2000. Yeah, so a big question about uh, the, the uh, effectiveness, ultimately, of those uh, confessions. Without the confessions, they might not have been able to build this case. That's exactly right. But the defense did get that uh, Florida Department of Law Enforcement agent to admit 
that he had no tangible or physical evidence against his client, Denise Williams. Matt, I want to throw this at you quick, quickly here. One of the lovers' versions of this case is that Denise Williams wanted to leave her husband, but she wouldn't divorce him for religious reasons, so murdering him is somehow okay religiously? Does this theory make any sense, or does it make the lover look like a liar? No, it's it's bizarre uh, to, to, to suggest that you have some, uh, you know, moral... Uh, issue with regard to divorce, but not with murder. I mean, this case, uh, from the prosecution standpoint, is about 1.75 million. That's what you wanted. You don't get 1.75 million with a divorce, but you get it with a murder. You get it with the death of your husband. Matt, we're going to check back in with you and, of course, with Vincent in a couple of minutes here. Let's go to the first several witnesses for the state. They testified about finding the victim's belongings. He came up and handed me uh, a camouflage hunting jacket. Uh, the sleeve was, one sleeve was turned inside and out like somebody was trying to get it off. Objection. Can you also continue to describe the condition of the hunting jacket? Uh, it was in, surprisingly, it was in great shape. I, 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 I put my hand in the, uh, in the pocket and pulled out his hunting license and uh, it was it, it said Mike Williams on it. It was very, uh, very clear. The next witness talked about finding the victim's waders, those waterproof pants that the victim wore while duck hunting. You yes, can. The waders were folded over and pulled down to the waist, like wrong side outwards up to that point. Up to the waist? Up to the waist. And you said you saw algae and some sediments on them. Can you describe that a little bit more? Well, it's obviously they had been there a little while. Now, I, don't, I can't give you a date as when or what have you. I, I'm not certain of that. I know they've been there long enough. There was settlement on them and uh, a growth, more or less. And the heat obviously had caused the air to form underneath the pocket where they were pulled down enough to rise these up or make them float up. Took a right smart for them to float up. And the packet within itself that was with the waiters had gun shells. And these shells, are they're, they're steel shot shells. And it took a right smart to float them up to that point. Okay. So you're saying they would have been weighted down so they had something that brought them to the surface? More or less. Okay. Still ahead tonight on the Daily Debrief, the star witness, the trigger man who told authorities he shot his friend. Not this guy, it's another guy. That guy said he hid the body. That's when we return on the Daily Debrief. Welcome back, everybody. A scathing report early this week blames officials with the U.S. Olympic Committee for failing to stop Larry Nasser. Nasser received federal and state sentences, which will effectively keep him in prison for life after he admitted to sexually abusing female athletes. A report prepared by the law firm Ropes and Gray this week indicated that two high-ranking officials with the U.S. Olympic Committee failed to investigate Nasser or report him to authorities after they learned of the accusations against him. Sentencing tomorrow for the former personal attorney to President Donald Trump. Michael Cohen pleaded guilty to financial and campaign charges and admitted his crimes were attempts to influence the election. He could face more than five years in prison. Law and Crime's Ron Blitzer, himself a former prosecutor, will be at the sentencing hearing. He'll be live on the Law and Crime Network and on the Daily Debrief with analysis tomorrow. Now to Anthony Velez with other crimes making headlines. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. A man in Nebraska who pleaded guilty to manslaughter for the killing of his wife 20 years ago reportedly confessed to the fatal shooting of his parents and his niece last year. 46-year-old John Dalton Jr. was arrested in 2017 for the shooting of his parents, 70-year-old John Dalton Sr. and 65-year-old Gene Dalton, as well as his niece, 18-year-old Leona Dalton Phillip, in their Omaha home. Dalton was paroled in 2010 after spending 11 years in prison for the fatal shooting of his wife, Shannon, in September 1998. Dalton pleaded guilty to three counts of first-degree murder and four weapons charges and was sentenced to three life terms plus up to 230 years in prison. 
The man accused of abducting and killing missing North Carolina teen Hania Nuelia Aguilar is now charged with an unsolved 2016 rape after his DNA linked him to the crime. 34-year-old Michael Ray McLellan is accused of kidnapping, raping, and murdering Aguilar, who disappeared on November 5th when she was reportedly forced into an SUV by a suspect outside her home in Lumberton. Aguilar's body was discovered 10 miles south of her home on November 27th. Authorities were able to link McLellan's DNA to the unsolved rape case after receiving results from the FBI laboratory at Quantico. McLellan now faces multiple felony charges. Authorities in Los Angeles reportedly found a trove of nude images of women in a storage unit of a University of California gynecologist accused of sexually abusing more than 200 women over a three-decade career. 71-year-old Dr. George Tyndall is accused of groping, performing improper exams, and taking photos of naked patients. Police allege the abuse occurred from 1990 to 2016 and say Tyndall reportedly treated over 10,000 women during that time period. Authorities reportedly raided a self-storage unit rented by Tyndall and found the trove of homemade pornography and photos of nude women in what appeared to be a medical exam room. Tyndall maintains his innocence and no charges have been filed yet. God! 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 A suspect in a double murder was denied bond in a Florida courtroom after screaming from a wheelchair during his bond hearing. 19-year-old Damon Kemp is accused of the fatal shooting of 19-year-old Trey Ingraham and 19-year-old Jordan Patton at their home in Daytona Beach. Kemp, who is reportedly staying with the two victims at their home, is seen being disruptive during his bond hearing. God! 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 I've reviewed your arrest warrant to is... determine whether there's probable cause for your arrest. That? Kemp now faces two counts of second-degree murder. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for The Daily Debrief. Now back to the Denise Williams trial and critical testimony from the former lover, the alleged accomplice Brian Winchester. Let's go straight to where he admits the shooting and killing the victim. This witness started by pushing the victim into the lake. Let's listen to his lengthy description in its entirety. So he was in the water. And he was, like, struggling. And the motor of the boat was still running. And I pulled off just a little bit to get kind of away from him so that he couldn't reach back into the boat. And I didn't know it at the time. I, I didn't know if he was trying to swim or I didn't know what was going on, but... but what I came to find out or eventually realized was he was taking the waders and the jacket off. And he, uh, he got those off and I, I think I forgot to tell you about this part before, but, um, but I remember now that that area of the lake had a lot of um, snags, a lot of dead trees that come up out of the water and there's a lot of stumps that come up out of the water. And he swam over to one of those stumps and held on to it. And he was panicking, and I was panicking, and none of this was like going well how I thought it was going to go. And I didn't, I didn't know what to do. But um, he was, he started to yell. And I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know how to get out of that situation. <laughs> and so I had my gun in the boat. And uh, so I loaded my gun and I just, I made one or two circles around and I ended up circling closer towards him and he was in the water and as I passed by, 
I shot him. Where did you shoot him? In the head. So when I shot him, it was dark, and there was a bright flash when that happened. And I didn't want to see what happened. So, like, I closed my eyes when the instant of that flash happened. And the boat was moving as this happened. And so I turned back around and came back to where he was and got to the stump. And I knew I couldn't, I couldn't leave him there being shot. So I was going to have to do something to cover this up. Back to the panel tonight, Vincent Hill. This is incredible testimony. Can you imagine being the officer who took the confession? Can you imagine being the officer he led to the location of the body? Well, he gave them everything that they needed, Aaron. And he gave very detailed uh, description of what happened. So we now know how the waiters got in the water, the jacket, everything that the investigator said, we now know he did it. He said that Mike took those off because he was trying to swim. It's very difficult to swim in that in, in, with that uh, stuff on. So then he drives around on the boat, then he shoots him in the head. So investigators got everything they needed based on this confession and based on where he said the body was. Now, the problem is, does that actually tie to Denise Williams and her involvement in this? Because she was not there. It all corroborates, but there's got to be another step here. So, Matthew Mangino, do we trust this witness? Do you trust his demeanor? Do you trust him given the immunity agreement? Well, he really is, uh, uh, his demeanor is very cold, very matter of fact. I mean, he's talking about, you know, shooting his best friend in the head, uh, who he uh, attempted to drown by pushing him overboard. Um, you know, I, I think, he, you know, he certainly doesn't endear himself uh, to the jury. He's a, a calculated, uh, deliberative uh, killer. Mm -hmm. uh, and now he has to tie in Denise Williams into what his act was in, in killing Mike Williams. Matthew, Vincent, appreciate you joining us tonight on The Debrief. We are out of time. A reminder, folks, our coverage of the cross-examination of that key witness, Brian Winchester, is going to pick up at 9 a.m. That's going to be here on the Law and Crime Network. You will not want to miss that cross-examination. The testimony critical. The cross-examination promises to be biting. How are defense attorneys going to isolate their client from Brian Winchester, the man you just heard admit to pulling the trigger? Our live coverage kicks off at 9. I'll see you back here on The Debrief from 5 to 5.30. Have a good evening.